Hi everyone, uh, so today I'll be telling you about YJIT, which is a just-in-time compiler that we're building inside of CRuby, which is the reference implementation of Ruby. Um, so first I'll tell you about Ruby and some of the optimization challenges that come with this programming language, uh, why we're building YJIT inside of CRuby, uh, lazy basic block versioning, which is uh, the JIT compiler architecture at the heart of YJIT, uh, some of the uh, uh, implementation choices that we've made uh, in implementing YJIT inside of CRuby, and then finally some early performance results and some of the next steps that we plan to take. So YJIT stands for yet another Ruby JIT, which is a nod at uh, the YARF bytecode uh, that we're compiling in uh, YJIT. This project is a team project uh, led by a small team in uh, the Code Foundations group at Shopify. Uh, so myself, Alan Wu, and Aaron Patterson. Uh, I have the chance of being helped in this project by some amazing engineers uh, that are deeply familiar with uh, CRuby, and this project would not be possible without them. Um, I'll begin by stating that we're really early into this project. We're only a couple of months in. So it's, it's pretty early to talk about performance. We don't really have any amazing numbers uh, to, uh, to present to you, although I will discuss some performance numbers. Uh, but I'm coming to more VMs to discuss our project and design, and also to solicit feedback from uh, experts. YJIT has a fairly unique and, I think, interesting design that's based around uh, lazy basic block versioning, which is novel uh, just-in-time compiler architecture. And we're building this JIT incrementally inside of CRuby, which is an approach that I think is, is pretty different um, from most uh, JIT compiler for dynamic languages out there. So the goal of YJIT is to produce uh, real speedups on real-world software, not just synthetic benchmarks. It's being built at Shopify and it's fully open source uh, under the same license as CRuby. But we're hoping that we're eventually going to be able to uh, merge this upstream. The CRuby, the CRuby uh, code base is very complex and uh, we're basically building a just-in-time just, just -in -time compiler inside of the interpreter and we're doing it incrementally, uh, gradually adding more functionality, uh, basically re-implementing some parts uh, of the interpreter in the JIT compiler. The benefits of our approach building this inside of CRuby is that it's uh, a drop-in replacement for uh, the existing Ruby binary, and it's easier to stay up to date with uh, changes in the language, which I think is, is uh, something that's highly underrated and I'll touch on later in this presentation. So, Let's talk a little bit about uh, Ruby. So first, uh, a little bit of history. Uh, the language was created in Japan by Yukihiro Matsumoto, uh, who likes to be called uh, Mats. He obtained his CS degree from the University of Tsukuba and studied programming language and compilers there. The language design started in 1993 and the first public release was in 1995. But the popularity only really surged in 2005 uh, with the rise of Ruby on Rails. The language draws inspiration from Perl, Python, Ruby, Smalltalk, and Lisp. And Matz wanted to create something that was more of a, a true uh, object-oriented language. Uh, in some ways, you could say that it's more true OO than Python because it follows the uh, everything is an object design philosophy of Smalltalk. That means that you can redefine primitives just like in Smalltalk. And Ruby aims to make the programmer happy. Uh, which I think translates into uh, having a lot of features and many different ways of doing things in uh, the programming language. Uh, so for, for a little bit of historical context, the first public release of Ruby was in 1995, uh, which if we look at this chart of the NASDAQ, we can see was uh, kind of just at the inflection point uh, before the dot-com boom. So there was a lot of excitement at the time around the internet, but I think there was also a lot of excitement around computers in general, in part because uh, processing power uh, was increasing exponentially, clock speeds were, were going up exponentially, as well as the number of transistors. Of course, we know that single core speed uh, has started to taper down uh, in the last decade or two, unfortunately. So in terms of features, uh, I would say Ruby fits in the same broad category as Python and JavaScript. It's a dynamically typed language uh, with late binding and it is object oriented. It has some functional constructs uh, such as blocks, which are basically lambdas. 
map and filter, etc., etc. It has a numerical tower uh, with fixed nums, which are fixed precision integers, flow nums, and also big nums. And it's got uh, some pretty in-depth object-oriented programming facilities, including classes in inheritance. And it follows the everything is an object design of Smalltalk. It's a language that's notoriously difficult to optimize. There's a classic blog post on the subject called So You Want to Optimize Ruby, which I encourage you to uh, to take a look at because it's still very relevant, even though it's from uh, 2012. But some of the challenges that I personally found the most difficult to tackle are uh, listed in this slide. Uh, one of the most important is that every operation on every basic type can be redefined. So that means even arithmetic operations on integers and floats can be redefined at runtime. You can redefine the meaning of uh, integer plus integer, and you can even redefine the meaning of of nil. Basically, you can you can redefine the meaning of comparing something to nil. You can also redefine methods at runtime. So the language has classes, but at any time you can reopen a class and define new methods, uh, remove methods, redefine methods. It's a language that also has constants, but what you'll find is that constants in Ruby are not actually constants. Uh, they, they can change at runtime as well. You also have a facility that allows you to inspect stack frames and you can read stack frames from the caller inside of a callee. You can also write local variables inside of, uh, inside of the caller, which kind of breaks the encapsulation principle. And I think you can kind of imagine why that would make optimization difficult because it means inside of your, your JIT compiler, if you're calling a method, unless you know that this method is not going to look at look and touch your locals, you can't really assume that uh, local variables are going to remain the same type across calls, for example. In addition to this, uh, the, the logic behind method calls is very complex. So CRuby implements 11 different kinds of method dispatch that deal uh, with uh, various situations. On top of this, uh, real-world code has a lot of very small methods because it's so object-oriented uh, and people tend to add multiple layers of abstraction. Uh, it's method calls all the way down. And also inlining is very, very challenging, which is problematic because you you need to be able to inline deeply in order to uh, to really optimize Ruby code. And finally, there's kind of the same difficulty as in Python, which is that CRuby has a C extensions API, and the C extensions API exposes some of the internals of the implementation of uh, CRuby. So before I, I uh, go on to tell you more about YJIT, I figure I should talk a little bit about the space of Ruby JITs. So Ruby is kind of interesting because uh, there's multiple projects to implement our Ruby JITs, some dead, some still active. Uh, so in this slide, I'm just naming a few. There's Maglev, JRuby, Truffle Ruby, uh, the Mirror JIT, and uh, MJIT. And I'll tell you a little bit about uh, some of the most uh, recent implementation efforts. So Mirror was the brainchild of Vladimir Makarov, who is a GCC developer. And the name of the compiler means uh, medium level IR JIT. So the key idea of this compiler was that Ruby and C could be compiled into the same intermediate representation. And uh, I think what Vladimir was going after here is that there's a lot of C code inside of CRuby. So much of the implementation of CRuby is defined in terms of C code. So if you could compile parts of the implementation of CRuby in your JIT, it would allow your just-in-time compiler to be able to uh, to inline some of these functions and optimize them uh, more easily. And this is still under development, but it seems to me that unfortunately Ruby is not really the focus. I think uh, Vladimir is enthusiastic about writing just-in-time compilers, but uh, his goal wasn't necessarily to, uh, to build uh, a Ruby JIT. Uh, but thankfully, this, this project also gave birth to MJIT, which is uh, a JIT that is already integrated inside of CRuby. So it's it's already available, already working. 
and uh, it's based on GCC. So the, the way that MJIT works basically is that it uh, generates C code for all of the all of the operations in the in the YARF bytecode, and then it it passes the the generated C code as 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 strings basically to GCC, and it has GCC compile uh, methods into dynamically linked objects that it can can then call from uh, from C Ruby. And I would say the, the strengths of this compiler is that yeah, it's already in C Ruby. It's compatible with the latest Ruby features. It offers good speed ups on smaller benchmarks, and it's officially supported on multiple platforms because it uses GCC as a backend. Basically, it makes it really easy to target all of the platforms um, that GCC already targets. In terms of trade offs, though, I would say there's some pretty major ones. Um, during the development of MJIT, they were very focused on this one synthetic benchmark called uh, OptCaret, and they were able to deliver some some uh, pretty major speed ups on it. But this benchmark is basically not representative of Ruby code. It's it's a benchmark that's kind of designed to be easy for uh, a just-in-time compiler to optimize. It has these these big methods that do a lot of integer arithmetics. Whereas if you take real world uh, code, for example, from Ruby on Rails, you find that there's a lot of small methods and that integer arithmetic is, is not that relevant. Um, I, and I would also say that unfortunately GCC is not really equipped to optimize a dynamically typed code. You know, if you generate a lot of, of uh, C code from a dynamically typed language and you just throw the code at GCC and you're hoping that GCC is going to do its magic, well, I would say GCC has a, a really strong backend with a lot of nice low-level optimizations, but it can't really understand uh, how to eliminate dynamic type checks uh, on its own. So it doesn't really yield speedups on large programs and uh, Rails in particular. Uh, Truffle Ruby is, uh, is a very interesting option. It's an alternative implementation of Ruby based on uh, Truffle and Graal. Uh, in terms of its strengths, it's still very much in active development. It has a very powerful optimizer that's based on a partial evaluation. Uh, there's some huge speed ups over CRuby on many benchmarks, and it has good support for uh, C extensions. Surprisingly, it's able to uh, basically emulate and uh, compile C code. In terms of trade offs, uh, one of the big ones is uh, warm up time. I would say that's currently still an issue on a lot of uh, Truffle and Graal. Based uh, just-in-time compilers, but uh, because they use an AST interpreter, they take quite a bit of time to to get up to speed. Uh, there's also much higher memory usage than C Ruby, which still unfortunately matters if you're running a server with um, a lot of different processes, for example. And lastly, it is a re-implementation of Ruby, which means that it's it's not necessarily a drop-in replacement in terms of compatibility with existing Ruby code. So when it comes to making a new alternative implementation of a programming language, we talk a lot about performance, but we don't talk very much about compatibility. Uh, but I think it's a major challenge that affects the adoption of alternative implementations of programming languages. And it's something that doesn't just affect Ruby implementations, but those for any other programming language as well. Um, if we take JRuby as an example, they have compatibility with Ruby 2.5.7 and they're working on 2.6. But Ruby 3.0 just got released and obviously there are future versions of Ruby in the works that are going to have even more new features that are going to put JRuby even more behind. Truffle Ruby has been in the works since 2013 and they've achieved tremendous performance on some benchmarks and they're doing a bit better than JRuby in terms of compatibility. Um, they've reached 2.7 recently and they are going to start working on 3.0 but it is a problem for them as well. Um, in terms of other programming languages, if we look at LuaJIT, it's a really impressive just-in-time compiler that's really well loved by the community but they have compatibility with Lua 5.1 and the reference implementation of the language is currently at 5.4, and that does unfortunately affect adoption of LuaJIT. 
PyPy has had its initial release in 2007 and it's clearly way faster than CPython in a lot of cases but it's also partially compatible with Python. They have support for Python 3.6 syntax but CPython is currently at 3.9 with uh, newer versions of Python in the works and I really think PyPy is, is some amazing work but unfortunately compatibility does affect the number of deployments that we see out there. And I think this problem of language compatibility is not just a technical problem. Unfortunately, it's due in large part to politics and also the rates of language evolution. We have a situation where alternative implementations of programming languages are often treated as second class citizens. And we also have that some languages are evolving too fast and keeping alternative implementations in a state where they're kind of always playing catch up. So Python was led by uh, a BDFL, a uh, Benevolent Dictator for Life until 2018, with CPython as the reference implementation. And there's been some changes. Now there's a, a vetting process, uh, the PEP that's in place, where uh, people can vote on language change. Uh, but still you have a situation where the rate of evolution of Python is very much dictated by CPython releases and I think that the fact that Python is evolving so fast makes it difficult for JIT implementations uh, to stay up to date but if you look at something like JavaScript you have that this is a language that was originally interpreted and yet it has multiple fast just-in-time compiler implementations so why is that what's the difference well JavaScript was officially standardized early on with ECMAScript in 1997 and you have an external standard body ECMA uh, that decides over what makes it into the language or not and you have multiple interested parties uh, that all care very much about performance and about just-in-time compiler implementations so in this situation there, there's no main JavaScript implementation and language evolution is more conservative which is which just makes it easier for, for just-in-time compilers to, uh, to stay up to date with the language. So the situation with the Ruby programming language is very similar to that of Python before the PEP vetting process. Matsumoto is the BDFL of the Ruby programming language and he personally vets a lot of the changes that make it into the language or not. And CRuby is the reference implementation of Ruby. I think there's one key difference though which is that the Ruby core developers have been very welcoming of just-in-time compilers with MJIT already integrated inside of CRuby and Matsumoto expressing desire for a faster just-in-time compiler for Ruby in his latest keynote. And so we've made the decision to build YJIT inside of CRuby because we thought that would give us better compatibility with the Ruby programming language. That means that we have to work with a lot of the design choices that were made by CRuby in a code base that is almost three decades old at this point. Uh, but on the flip side, we get instant compatibility with all Ruby packages and it's a lot easier for us to keep up to date with language changes in the future. In the next part of the presentation, I'm going to tell you about Lazy Busy Block Versioning, which is the just-in-time compiler architecture that's at the core of YJIT. So Lazy Busy Block Versioning is research work that was starting during my PhD at the University of Montreal. During my thesis, I built Higgs, which was an optimizing just-in-time compiler for JavaScript, and I was focused on the idea of optimizing dynamic programming languages, and more specifically, eliminating dynamic type checks. So lazy busy block versioning is a way to do type specialization without doing type analysis in the traditional sense, so without using a fixed point iterative type of analysis. And it's also a reimagination of what a JIT compiler could be. So traditional JIT compilers are method-based, whereas basic block versioning operates at a lower level of granularity, that of basic blocks. It's a lightweight single pass code generation technique that aims to deliver a really good bang for your buck in terms of compilation time versus performance of the generated code. And there's a small but fairly diverse body of literature already uh, the first paper that we published at eCoop back in 2015 uh, explains how to do intra-procedural basic block versioning to remove dynamic type checks. We then published a second paper at eCoop in 2016 that does inter-procedural 
uh, type specialization with basic block versioning. So passing type information across function call boundaries and also using typed object shapes to eliminate uh, type checks on values read from object properties. My advisor then went on to publish uh, a paper about using basic block versioning to optimize functional languages such as uh, Scheme. And there's also been some work on using basic block versioning to optimize gradual typing. And there's also some ongoing work on optimizing uh, Python using basic block versioning back at the University of Montreal. So there's two key components of lazy basic block versioning. The first is the versioning of basic blocks, which serves to accumulate and propagate type information. Uh, we specialize basic blocks on contact based on context objects that store type information at the current point during compilation. And we do selective tail duplication to try to unfold the control flow graph and propagate type information. Then there's a second component that's lazy code generation. Uh, that is, we only generate code strictly when it's needed, just when it's about to be executed, which makes basic block versioning um, in a way more truly just in time than a method-based compiler, because we don't compile, for example, a branch of an if-else statement that doesn't get executed. And we we do lazy tail duplication, essentially. So it's kind of like lazy evaluation for code, where we're treating the control flow graph as a potentially infinite data structure. So if we have a structure like this in a programming language where uh, we have a type check, uh, for example, is fixed num n, and if n happens to be a fixed num, we go to block b, otherwise we go to block c, and then we merge at block d. Uh, this looks something like this in terms of a control flow graph. And we have the property that if n happens to be a fixed num, uh, we go to block b, and inside block b, we know that n is a fixed num. If n isn't a fixed num, we take the false branch, we go to block c, and in block C, we know that n is not a fixed num. But unfortunately, when we're merging back at D, uh, we know that n is either a fixed num or not a fixed num. So basically, we know nothing at all. So you can do this thing called tail duplication, where basically you generate two different versions of block D, uh, D prime and D prime prime, and then you can maintain your type information across of your blocks. So this is, this is one of the two key ideas uh, behind basic block versioning. Uh, but obviously, you're looking at this and you're asking yourself, well, this might work for a really small control flow graph, but when you're doing this, you're increasing the code size. And you can't really duplicate blocks ad infinitum because in reality, in your program, you might have some control flow graphs like this. And if you were to duplicate based on the type of every variable inside of, of a big method like this, you would end up with an, an, a huge increase in code size. So back to our little toy example, um, the key idea with lazy basic block versioning is that because we're only lazily generating code, in the case where n happens to be a fixed num, if we have that n is never not a fixed num during the execution of a program, then we don't have to generate the false branch at all. And so we only generate one version of the block D, in fact. So the key of basic block versioning is not to generate multiple versions of basic blocks. It's actually to use versioning as a tool to propagate type information. So when it comes to designing algorithms for compilers, it's nice to have some hard guarantees in terms of running time and memory usage. And it's really easy to do that with basic block versioning because we can simply impose a cap on the number of block versions that we're willing to generate for any given block. And if we ever hit the limit, we can simply generate generic versions for any basic block that will accept any incoming type. But it turns out, what I found during my research with JavaScript is that across all of our benchmarks, even if we don't put a limit on the number of block versions that we generate, it's very rare that a basic block will have more than one version. We only get about 5% of blocks with two versions getting generated. And then we have a long tail with fewer and fewer uh, 
blocks having three or four or five versions, for example. So in order to be able to generate code lazily, we have to use stubs and code patching, which you might be thinking, that must mean that the machine code you generate is full of jumps everywhere, turning it, turning it into spaghetti code. But thankfully, we found a way to generate code that is more efficient than that. So if we go back to our little toy example, if we have uh, a type check is fixed num with two possible branches, what we do is that initially we produce stubs for both blocks B and C. And then we wait for the program to tell us which way it's going to go. And then, for example, here, if block B gets executed first, then we go and we generate code for block B. And we're going to remove the original branch that we had and patch the code so that we generate an out of line jump to the stub for C. But if we go to the B branch, we can just directly fall through. And then for the block D, we can just generate that block directly after B without there being a jump. So again, we're falling through. And the machine code that we're generating is fairly efficient. The next question I'm going to touch on is whether basic block versioning is strictly weaker than a meta-based just-in-time compiler. After all, basic block versioning has kind of a myopic view of the code, being that it looks at individual basic blocks and some optimization, like allocation syncing, are going to be probably less natural in basic block versioning than if you're working with entire methods at a time. But I would make the argument that in some ways, basic block versioning is more precise, because we're never compiling code that isn't executed, and so uh, our type information isn't polluted by piece of code, pieces of code that aren't executed, and we're only generating code for types that are seen at runtime which we can know precisely. We also avoid losing type information in control flow merges. And lastly, we're able to naturally linearize and flatten the machine code based on the order in which blocks execute in the program. Whereas in a method-based compiler, you kind of have to guess based on heuristics and maybe profiling information as to which order the basic blocks are going to be executed in. But what you have is just a guess. And finally, I would say the two are not necessarily mutually exclusive. For example, you could use basic block versioning as a baseline just-in-time compiler, and you could use it to accumulate information in ways that are more sophisticated than what could be possible with a profiler, because you can unfold the control flow graph. You could also use basic block versioning inside of an interpreter, again, to give you more precise information about your control flow graph and unfold it so that you could then feed it to a method-based compiler to generate better code. And I think there's a compelling case that some future compilers might do this. So basic block versioning allows you to generate type-specialized machine code while using a lot less memory and a lot less compilation time than a whole program type analysis. But how does it actually compare to a whole program type analysis in terms of the percentage of type checks that are eliminated. Uh, this is one of the questions that I wanted to answer during my PhD. Um, but we face kind of a problem when comparing basic block versioning with uh, a type analysis, which was that whichever type analysis we were going to implement to compare to basic block versioning, we were afraid that, re that conference reviewers would tell us that the analysis we implemented was not sophisticated enough or was not the latest. And so what we decided to do instead is to compare basic block versioning against uh, a simulated analysis that had perfect accuracy. So basically, we recorded uh, the execution of each of our benchmarks once. And basically, for everywhere inside of the control flow graph where there was a dynamic type check, if the type check always evaluates uh, to the same result during the execution of a program, uh, we said that our simulated analysis is able to uh, to predict the outcome. So basically, the simulated analysis has perfect inf information and it's able to eliminate every type check that always that always goes the same way. And so, how does that compare to basic block versioning? Well, in this graph, you can see over 26 benchmarks, uh, some bars that represent the proportion of type checks that were eliminated. Uh, so higher is better.
And interestingly enough, on average, basic block versioning does better than the simulated perfect analysis with access to perfect information. So how is that even possible? Well, because it's able to do a selective tail duplication uh, and because it doesn't lose type information in a control form merges as much as a traditional type analysis, um, it's able to recover more type information than this perfect analysis. So in this next part of the presentation, I'm going to tell you more about how we went to integrate YJIT inside of CRuby. So CRuby is a fairly old code base that's implemented in C99, and it's a pretty typical uh, stack-based interpreter. It compiles the AST to uh, what they call YARF bytecode, and the stack-based VM has a program counter, a temporary stack where values can be pushed and popped, and for each stack frame, it has a frame pointer that's used to access local variables. It's a direct threaded interpreter, which means that instead of, of storing um, just a list of opcodes for every method, it stores a list of addresses uh, basically for computed go-tos that go to, uh, to pieces of code that are used to implement each opcode inside of uh, the interpreter. And basically each of these uh, pieces of code jumps to the next instruction. And it also has monomorphic inline caches for a method dispatch and object property access. So the Yarpite code was originally implemented by Koichi Sasada and merged into CRuby in 2007. Prior to that, uh, CRuby had an AST interpreter. So the bytecode interpreter was uh, a huge improvement in terms of performance. Uh, in CRuby, each method has an associated instruction sequence, aka an iSeq. And there's a few categories of uh, instructions which are fairly standard. So there's some stack and local variable manipulation instructions like uh, put and pop, uh, get local, which allows you to uh, to read a local variable and set local, which allows you to uh, write the value of a local. There's branching instructions like jump and uh, branch if, branch unless for conditional uh, jumping. There's also some object instantiation and uh, manipulation instructions and the send instruction, which does method calls. There's also many instructions uh, like, for example, uh, plus for doing addition that are dynamically typed so that means that the plus instruction will behave differently if you pass uh, integers or floating point numbers or strings or arrays, etc. And a lot of our work uh, basically is to try to optimize that. So because Ruby is such a complex programming language and there's so many features to implement, we decided to start by implementing YJIT gradually inside of the interpreter. Um, so the CRuby interpreter is direct threaded, which means that it has pointers to these uh, instruction handlers uh, that are pieces of code that implements uh, each of the CRuby instruction. And we decided to take advantage of that with YJIT. So basically, if we want to compile a new uh, send instruction in YJIT, for example, we can make gen generate a code in a way that's going to conform to uh, the API used by the existing instruction handlers. And then basically, the interpreter is going to be able to dispatch uh, normal instruction handlers and then eventually it'll jump to the piece of code that we generated just as if it were a normal piece of the interpreter. So the advantage here is that we can transfer control back and forth between the interpreter and our disk compiler very efficiently. So in a just-in-time compiler, it's very useful to be able to speculate that is to make some assumptions at compile time while generating code and to discard the code that we've generated if those assumptions turn out to be broken at runtime. Um, in a method-based JIT, the way that this is usually done is that um, entire methods are discarded if assumptions are broken and unstack replacement is used uh, to transfer to de-optimized versions of the methods that have been discarded. Uh, with basic block versioning, we can do a neat trick, which is that it's pretty easy to replace individual basic blocks with stubs. And those stubs are going to get recompiled on the next execution. So for example, if we have some method add that, that does some integer addition, and 
here we'd like to be able to speculate that the plus operator hasn't been uh, redefined and that integer add is uh, in fact integer add, not something else that's been redefined by the user. Uh, we can generate some code that's going to assume that uh, those basic operations haven't been redefined. But then if at runtime the program happens to uh, reopen the integer class and redefine the meaning of plus, then YJIT can invalidate individual blocks that rely on this assumption and basically patch the predecessors of these blocks to jump to a new addition block that doesn't make uh, this assumption. And this is very easy to do with basic block versioning. So in a just a time compiler, we often want to specialize code based on types and values that are seen at runtime. In a traditional method-based JIT compiler, we might do this by first doing a profiling run in an interpreter or in a baseline JIT and recording uh, type information or various statistics, and then having a second optimizing JIT compiler that's going to take this profiling information and insert guards so that it can produce more optimized machine code. Instead, in YJIT, we implement a technique that we call uh, deferred compilation and type capture. So basically, what we do is that we use stubs to defer compilation as late as possible, and then we can peek at runtime values inside of the compiler. So this is an idea that was first covered in a paper by Armin Rigo about the psycho prototype JIT for Python. So to give you a small example, Say we have a method get that takes two parameters obj and idx and it basically does either an array indexing or a hash indexing operation. So in Ruby, we can call a uh, Ruby VM instruction sequence disasm to get the sequence of bytecode instructions for this method. And what we see is that we have a short sequence of four bytecode instructions. The first get local instruction is going to take the local var variable obj and push its value on the temporary stack. Then we're going to push the value of uh, local variable idx on the stack. Then the third bytecode instruction is going to be doing our array or hash indexing. And then finally, leave is going to implement uh, the return. So how do we compile this in YJIT? Well, we're going to compile uh, the first two get local instructions uh, immediately. And then when we get to the AREF instruction, we're going to simply generate a stub. And what this stub is going to do is that it's going to wait for the execution of the program to get to the opt AREF instruction. And then when the program is about to execute the AREF instruction, it'll call back into YJIT and YJIT will be able to peek at the types of values at runtime. So in this case, we're going to peek uh, at the types and we're going to see that the first call to our get method is going to be happening with an array. So we're going to generate a guard that checks that the object class is array. And if not, we're going to send that to another stub. And we're also going to guard on the type of IDX and we're going to say, if IDX is not an integer, uh, then we're going to jump to the interpreter and let the interpreter handle this. And then we're going to be able to generate uh, an array get uh, piece of machine code that's going to be optimized specifically to handle the case of array indexing with integers. But then if we call the get method again, uh, this time with a hash, then we're going to uh, hit our first stub and uh, we're going to generate a different block version that's going to be optimized for uh, the case where we have hashes. So then we'll, we'll simply guard that obj.class is a hash. And if not, we're going to send that to another stub. And then behind our guard, we can generate uh, an optimized hash get and then uh, go to the return block. Now let's move on to some uh, early performance results. So the first thing I want to show you is that if we take uh, a CPU and we expose it to code generated by YJIT, we see that the CPU is uh, much happier. Therefore, uh, our code is of very, very high quality. 
Uh, yeah, well, all kidding aside, as I was saying earlier, uh, it's very early into this project. Uh, we're only about six months in. Uh, we're currently not doing any inlining. Uh, we're using the CRuby stack directly without a register allocator. So we don't really have uh, amazing performance results. But one important result that we do have is that we're very close to 100% compatible with CRuby. Uh, we're passing all of the tests, so, and there's about 30,000 of them. And we're already able to run Rails Bench, uh, which has about 4,000 compiled methods uh, in WhiteJet. And so uh, that's that's very important and very good because it means uh, we think we're going to be able to succeed at producing a JIT that is uh, basically a, a drop-in replacement and has 100% compatibility uh, with existing Ruby code. And so far in the six months that we've been working on this project, uh, the internal bytecode uh, inside of CRuby has been pretty stable and it's been pretty easy to keep up with upstream changes. We rarely ever get uh, merge conflicts. An important question uh, that we were worried about is that of code size. So typical modern CPUs have about 32 kilobytes of L1 instruction cache and uh, poorly optimized code tends to, to get very large. It's easy to generate uh, in YJIT 500 bytes of code, even for small methods. So we were really worried that we were going to get a lot of iCache misses and get really terrible performance. And uh, in our first tests, we were often underperforming the interpreter. Um, the interpreter, it turns out, has kind of a, a code size advantage because you can represent highly dynamic operations with uh, a single opcode that might take uh, only a couple of bytes, and the interpreter kind of acts like uh, microcode for a VM. Uh, however, what we found is that the biggest issue seems to be uh, trashing. So switching back and forth between the interpreter and the JIT really often is is really bad uh, for for the iCache because the interpreter, uh, when we jump back to the interpreter, is going to to boot our generated code out of the iCache, and uh, when we jump back to our generated code code is going to boot uh, the interpreter's code out of the iCache. And of course, the interpreter has a lot of unpredictable or hard to predict branches that are going to uh, to to impair performance as well. However, if we can stay in our uh, generated code longer, if we can generate longer sequences of machine code and that are nice and linear and predictable, uh, the performance starts to rapidly improve. So in terms of benchmarks, uh, we want to use real-world software as much as possible. Uh, I think in compiler conferences, microbenchmarks are, are typically dismissed as trivial, and real-world software is the ultimate test. But sometimes uh, it's hard to work with real-world software as well, because real-world software is a moving target. It tends to have a lot of dependencies. It's often hard to deploy, and uh, there can be breaking changes. And if the software is constantly changing, then you know it becomes hard to know uh, are the changes in performance reflective of what you changed in your compiler or what's changed in the software. And it can also be difficult to pinpoint performance problems uh, in large pieces of code. Maybe you're underperforming uh, another implementation of the language, but you don't necessarily know why. And so I would argue that benchmarks are like tests and more is better. And even synthetic benchmarks can be interesting if they expose flaws and performance bugs in your compiler. I would also say it's interesting because you can construct synthetic benchmarks adversarially uh, to test kind of pain performance points in your implementation. And so for YJIT, we uh, strive for a combination of some existing synthetic benchmarks, uh, but also benchmarks that are based on real world software or real-world Ruby packages. And ultimately, we will test YJIT in production at Shopify on really large-scale software. Uh, we don't want to work with uh, benchmarks for, we, we really want to, we really want to test this uh, with real software. So now, I hope you don't get mad at me when I show you performance results on a set of benchmarks, some of which are most definitely micro-benchmarks. But like I said, we're pretty early in this project and we got to start somewhere.
Um, so in this graph, you can see uh, the performance of uh, YJIT uh, relative to the interpreter. So here, uh, lower is better. Uh, we have a ratio of basically uh, the time taken by YJIT over uh, the time taken by the interpreter. And I've sorted the benchmarks uh, approximately uh, so that the benchmarks that are, that are the most toy-like uh, are on the left and the benchmarks that are the most real-world-like are on the right side. So the teal colored benchmarks are uh, micro benchmarks. And yeah, we can see that on micro benchmarks, it's really easy for YJIT to deliver a speed up just because it's executing less machine instructions than the interpreter. Uh, on the far right, uh, liquid render and rails bench are uh, benchmarks that are based very much in uh, real world software. And the orange bars in the middle are synthetic benchmarks, uh, some of which are pretty sizable. Uh, others not so much and um, yeah there's a couple of these results that are interesting uh, I was pretty happy to see that we're generating about a 5% speed up on liquid render uh, this is the liquid template language renderer uh, that uh, was built at uh, Shopify on Rails Bench we have about performance parity with the interpreter uh, which is encouraging for us because originally we had about minus 7% but as we've been making improvements in the JET, we've been uh, getting closer and closer to parity. And I think that pretty soon we'll be able to actually deliver a speed up on Rails Bench, which, like I said earlier, has about 4,000 uh, compiled methods in YJIT. So it's it's a, it's very much a sizable program. Uh, OptCaret is the classic um, Ruby benchmark. Uh, we have a 15% speed up on that one, which I think is, uh, is pretty good. And... Uh, yeah, some some more interesting results in there. Um, the binary trees and n body benchmarks are, are some of the classic uh, computer language uh, shootout benchmarks. And interestingly enough, those benchmarks are very small, but YJIT is not currently delivering a speed up. We're about at parity with the interpreter, and I think this is interesting because uh, it just goes to show, even though those benchmarks are very much micro benchmarks, I think we can stand to learn something from them. So I think in the coming weeks, we're going to go and dive into these benchmarks and uh, they're going to help us identify performance performance bugs um, in YJIT. And uh, yeah, in the middle, the 30K methods benchmark is a synthetic benchmark uh, that I built that has 30,000 methods uh, that are basically getting called in, uh, in a big loop uh, with a call hierarchy that's 30, 30 methods deep. So I built this benchmark uh, early on because we were really concerned about code size. So I was kind of curious if we build a benchmark that uh, is going to generate a massive amount of code because it has 30,000 methods, um, how how does the performance of YJIT compare to the interpreter? And the performance is, is really, really good because um, the sequence of code that's generated by YJIT is really nice and linear. So this benchmark is is not at all representative of our real world code, but I think what it goes to show is that in this benchmark, even though we're generating more than a megabyte of code and we have something, we have a huge loop body that doesn't fit at all in the L instruction cache, because the sequence of code is nice and predictable, we're able to get very good performance. So this was interesting to me just because it shows that even if it doesn't fit in the I cache and there are some I cache misses, that doesn't mean that performance necessarily has to be bad. So, um, yeah, Ruby is a very complex programming language. Uh, every operation applies to multiple different types. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Ruby implements 11 kinds of method dispatch. And so there's a lot of work for us to do in YJIT uh, in order to, to uh, improve performance. There's a lot of different bytecode instructions that we have to implement. And so because there's so much work to do, it's really useful for us to gather uh, some useful metrics to guide our development efforts. Otherwise, we're kind of like using intuition to decide what we should prioritize next. And often intuition can be wrong. And so, yeah, we, we added a command line option, uh, dash dash widget stats that, uh, allows us to gather some some statistics. Um, and currently what we're most concerned about 
is maximizing the time that we spend in uh, JDA code. And so how we're going about prioritizing that is that we, for every time that we transition from the JIT to the interpreter, presumably because there's some bytecode instruction or a certain behavior inside of a bytecode instruction that's not supported by YJIT, uh, we we log that in, uh, in st statistics. And so we can produce these, uh, these pie charts that tell us which instructions or which specific behaviors inside of a bytecode instruction cause us to bail to the interpreter. And so, yeah, right now we're just going with uh, low hanging fruits, trying to eliminate the causes of exits to the interpreter that are the most frequent. And yeah, we've already eliminated uh, several of them. And as we close the gaps, you know, the proportions change and uh, that allows us to uh, decide what we're going to focus on next. So in this last part of the presentation, I'm going to touch a little bit on some of our future plans for YJIT and also make a potentially provocative statement. So in terms of future plans, uh, one of the things that we're looking at is building a more sophisticated backend for YJIT, uh, where we separate the type specialization logic from the code gen. Uh, because currently what we're doing is we ch directly generate x86-64 uh, machine code um, based on uh, basic block versioning. Um, we're targeting only x86-64 just because that's kind of like the most common on uh, the servers that are being used at Shopify. And also because we thought it'd be simpler uh, just to prototype our just-in-time compiler. But in the long run, we'd like to have a backend that can also support ARM64 and that would separate uh, the logic used for, for type specialization from uh, the parts that are more uh, machine specific. We'd also like to maybe implement some richer context objects uh, that store uh, more precise type information. And so we're looking at a pure functional uh, representation using hash con consing. Uh, we think that would be both more compact, so uh, less, uh, less memory uh, necessary and that would also allow us to store uh, more information. And lastly, we're also looking at bringing object shapes, aka uh, hidden classes to CRuby. Uh, this is a common strategy used uh, to implement objects in uh, uh, JavaScript VMs such as uh, V8. And uh, we think it could be both simpler and a lot more efficient than the strategy that's uh, used in uh, CRuby right now which is, uh, is very complex and really not ideal for, for JIT. So if we implement object shapes in CRuby, we think that could benefit us, but it could also benefit uh, MJIT, which is uh, the existing uh, Ruby JIT in CRuby. Uh, now for something that could be a provocative statement, my personal opinion is that dynamic languages that don't have good just-in-time compilers are probably going to become extinct or at least uh, fade from the mainstream. And this might be kind of hard to believe right now given that Python is uh, so popular despite the fact that CRuby is interpreted and there are no plans as far as I know to implement a just-in-time compiler inside of CRuby. But as it is, this prediction is based on fundamental principles. Uh, single code performance has been stagnating for about two decades and we're wasting energy and CPU cycles on language implementations that are pretty inefficient. And we have the technology to avoid this waste. I think what's been demonstrated very clearly with JavaScript JITs is that it's it's possible to get very close to 50% of performance of C with language like JavaScript. So why shouldn't it be possible to do the same thing for Python and for Ruby or for any other dynamically typed programming language for that matter? And also, we can basically never have enough computational power and technological progress is about eliminating inefficiency. So I think that the programming languages that don't have efficient implementations are going to go the same way as dinosaurs eventually. And yeah, in terms of Python, I think they, they consistently encourage people to write performance sensitive code in C and just call it from Python. And maybe this was okay back in 1995, but I think it's going to be less and less okay. And Python is kind of shooting itself in the foot by encouraging people to rewrite code in C because there's programming languages like D, Rust, Zig, and Nim that are emerging. 
that are statically typed and that are very convenient to write code in, uh, very comfortable and deliver very good performance at the same time. So I think if you're if you're asking people to step away from Python and go to another language to write performance sensitive code, people are going to ask themselves, well, why don't I just write this all of my code in uh, a more a better optimized programming language in, at the end of the day and get much better performance? Because if you have if you have for example Python code and C code or Ruby code and C code in your project, there's a very obvious imp impedance mismatch between the two languages. That's sometimes pretty painful to deal with. And so this is my plea to the Ruby community. Uh, with YJIT, we want to help make Ruby faster, but to do this, we need your help and support. Uh, I think there's a lot of value in being conservative when it comes to uh, the way a language evolves. Ruby is a mature and widely deployed language used in uh, multiple organizations. And I think it's very tempting to add a lot of features to a language in the hope that that's going to attract newcomers. But at the same time, every new feature that's added to a language is a constraint on every implementation of that language. And it, every new feature that gets added can make it potentially more challenging for MJIT, Truffle Ruby, Widget and any future JITs uh, to be performance competitive. And I think that performance is a feature and it needs to be valued more highly. CRuby is already a very complex machine and all of this complexity has a maintenance cost. It also makes it challenging to attract and onboard new contributors to the CRuby code base, the more complex CRuby becomes. And there's a few specific things in YJIT that we hope won't happen. Uh, basically, if there were major changes to the CRuby bytecode or changes in the semantics of method calls or more complex instance variable lookup semantics, that could be potentially difficult for YJIT to adapt, or at least it would be an additional obstacle along the way. And so we hope that that's not going to happen, that there's going to be some amount of stability there. To sum it all up, I've introduced uh, YJIT, which is a just-in-time compiler for Ruby uh, built around a lazy basic block versioning architecture. Lazy basic block versioning is like lazy evaluation for code. It's a method that allows you to capture type information as late as possible and that has a precision advantage over traditional uh, fixed point whole program type analysis and also produces a natural linearization of machine code uh, with very little effort. We're uh, very early in the YJIT project. We have modest performance results, but no dazzling numbers yet. But importantly, we're never slower than the interpreter, and we think that we have a clear path to much improve those performance numbers over the next coming weeks and months. And building this JIT compiler inside of CRuby has a huge compatibility advantage. We're already passing all of the CRuby tests, and so in under six months, we have about 100% compatibility with CRuby already. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the technology behind YJIT, I've included some references here that you can uh, easily look up with a Google search. And there's also uh, talks associated with uh, both of these papers that are available on YouTube if you just uh, search for the title. Uh, if you'd like to reach out to me and talk about compilers, you can ping me at my email address, uh, maxime.chevalierboisvert at shopify.com. You can also contact me via Twitter. And finally, if you're looking for a fun, stimulating, and flexible work environment, uh, Shopify and co-foundations are hiring. Uh, these are permanently remote positions. And uh, yeah, you can just send me uh, your resume at uh, my Shopify email address. Uh, yeah, so that's it. Uh, I'll be here to answer your questions. Thank you.